Coming up on American Black Journal, we'll talk with the head of the Michigan State Police and the Michigan Department of Civil Rights about a new report that shows African-American drivers are pulled over in much greater proportion than other drivers on Michigan roads. Plus, we'll take a glimpse into the life of the man who created what was once the largest African-American history museum in the United States. Stay where you are. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. A new report shows that black drivers in the state of Michigan were pulled over at a disproportionately high rate by state troopers in 2020. In addition, black and Hispanic drivers were searched and arrested more than white drivers over the same period. Now, it might surprise you to learn that it's the Michigan State Police who commissioned this report all on its own. I sat down with the director of the Michigan State Police, Colonel Joe Gasper, and the executive director of the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, John Johnson, to talk about how we deal with this disparity in policing. So I wanna start with both of your reactions to this report and, and what it says about policing uh, in our state. And then we'll talk about kind of where we go from here. But, but these are, these are um, very stark uh, conclusions uh, drawn by this uh, report, and I think they demand a lot of our attention. Uh, Colonel Gasper, it's your department that is the subject of this report. Tell me what your reaction was to all of this. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we're in a, a time in, in the country right now, really, where, you know, all police departments need to be uh, looking internally and externally to making sure that, uh, that, that we're evolving and that uh, you know, we're demonstrating best practices. And, and sometimes uh, you know, when you engage in uh, some uh, self-reflection, uh, you have a, a, a reminder that uh, you know, sometimes it's not what you want it to be. And this would uh, be one of those uh, times where you know, we, saw some disparity that was concerning to us. And so we you know, wanted to make sure that we understood it. Um, so we hired the Michigan State University and partnered with them. And um, uh, you know, they did the analysis on our, on our traffic stop data. And it uh, you know, was not where we want it to be. Um, so now we're in a, in a time period here where we need to better understand it. You know, the, the goal of the, the report was to identify if there was disparity. Uh, clearly, there's disparity. And now, you know, we've got an opportunity to understand why uh, that's occurring. Uh, uh, Colonel, I wonder if, um, if you were surprised by what you saw. I mean, it, it, it's always, I think, a little jarring to see things drawn out in statistics, right, and, and data. Uh, but, I, but I guess what I'm getting at is what was your sense of how this issue was playing out in the department before you saw the numbers? Yeah, you know, I think that 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 when you you know when I looked at something like this and and we see uh, you know the in the beginning it kind of the aggregate data um, where it was and uh, you know obviously that's something that you know we wanted to understand a little bit more and I think you know when the numbers came out you know I'm confident that 
you know, our troopers are out there doing um, what they've been trained to do. And, uh, and, and, you know, where the disparity is now, you know, clearly it's, it's concerning um, to, to everyone involved. And, you know, now the goal needs to be to, to, to do what we can to reduce that disparity. So, so John, this is an issue that um, that you and I have discussed before. It's an issue that I know you've worked on for a really long time, trying to draw attention to uh, this disparity. Uh, give me your reaction to the, to the, to the report. Yeah, um, thank you, Stephen, again for having us on this. And um, our reaction was uh, was it was not one of surprise, as you can imagine. As you've indicated, we've worked on these issues for for decades beginning with my a role with the Detroit NACP and so and uh, surrounding suburbs of Detroit where we identified racial profiling going on in a number of areas and it continues today. So uh, this is not a surprise. I do, however, must applaud Colonel Gasper for uh, ordering, commissioning this report, releasing the, the data of it and owning up to what it says and then uh, making some recommendations as to what he sees needs to be done in order to improve the conditions and going forward. So we applaud him for that. And our department stands ready to work with him in any way that we can in order to, to actualize the recommendations that he's put forth already. Yeah. So, so John, um, as you point out, I mean, you, you, you've done a lot of work here in the city of Detroit on, on civil rights issues for a really long time as well. I'm really curious what you think the distinction might be between this data about state police and what we want, might see if we did the same kind of report with DPD. Um, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of citizens who, who, who complain about their interactions with Detroit uh, police. Um, do, you, do you think this is a problem that would look the same here as it does as, at the state police? Well, I think that issue was raised recently by some folks in regards to DPD mm -hmm. and um, and, and I think uh, what allegations made by the public defender that arrests have escalated against people of color during the pandemic uh, based on possession of weapons. Um, I don't think any law enforcement agency is excluded from this. And uh, one of the things I hope comes of this and what Colonel Gasper has done is that other agencies will take stock of themselves and do their own internal audit uh, to be able to, uh, to bring the truth to light. Uh, that's and he's shown himself to be a leader in this category, and I hope other folks will follow suit. Um, we, you know, there's other problems in other areas. As a result, uh, studies have come out about about Lansing and and the 85% rate of, ju of black juveniles arrested over there. Uh, so uh, it's, it's 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 as we know, it's something that's that uh, fortunately that exists throughout our law enforcement departments. Um, and it's a culture that needs to be addressed, as we know, and I'm glad that Colonel Gasper is taking the steps to do that. Some of the recommendations that he's put forth and some of the ones that have been recommended in the MSU report of which we're speaking, I think would bring uh, a lot of uh, accountability. And that's what we seek. Um, it, it's good to have policies, but it's more important to have accountability when people don't violate those policies and procedures. And that must be in place also. Yeah. Uh, Colonel Gasper, two of the things that jump out at me from the report in terms of recommendations, uh, obviously, you know, training of officers in, in, in some sort of uh, sensitivity, I guess you might call it, to, to, to differences, cultural differences, but then also, um, you know, the, the, the racial makeup of the department itself. Um, now, neither of those uh, is a snap your finger <laughs> <laughs> kind of solution. Um, these are things that departments struggle with all the time. Uh, so tell me what, what your approach is going to be to those things. Yeah, so the training, uh, that, that's probably an easier uh, thing to accomplish. Uh, we've already started to uh, make some significant modifications in the area of training. Um, in the last couple of recruit schools that we've done, uh, we have a uh, a couple hour block every week uh, in the evening where we have the, the recruits uh, in, in the current environments, a virtual environment, and they sign on uh, to a cultural competency or cultural awareness um, speaker. And so we've had a number of speakers from, from various communities. Um, one obviously is uh, from the African-American community and it's been, it's been very insightful. Uh, 
because, uh, especially from a historical perspective, uh, you know, that, that obviously is, is an important part of, you know, some of the challenge that we have here and uh, making sure that our members are uh, aware of that history is very important. Um, we are um, actually implementing um, a much more comprehensive um, um, history of policing in our recruit school, hoping to start that uh, as soon as our next recruit school here in the, in the next several weeks, and then offering that um, in an in-service capacity too. Um, and then, you know, just broadly, you know, paying attention to, you know, how do we bring in more specific um, training when it comes to cognitive or implicit bias, um, you know, the, the, the cultural awareness, uh, you know, there's a lot of troopers that, that may not grow up in a very culturally diverse area of the state or the country and, uh, and, and would not have any way of really knowing uh, some of that background. So that's, that's an important part. So we feel really confident that, that we're gonna be able to be successful with that. And, and, and a huge component of that, that too is, is partnering with the community. You know, we recently solicited input um, and, and interest from the community to come be part of um, our uh, several day uh, scenario based um, training and we wanted the community to actually be um, role players for that. Um, so that was successful. We can we plan to continue that, uh, but then also uh, continuing to partner with uh, some of our uh, community groups, some of our universities and colleges to um, to, to work on that training. Um, the, 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 the recruiting, you know, we're, we're not where we, where we want to be. We're not where we need to be. Uh, you know, we need to continue to, uh, to try, you know, a big uh, component of, of recruiting and, and getting people into the department is making sure, especially from a diversity perspective that, that, uh, young people or people that are interested in coming into the Michigan state place that they can see themselves, not only as a trooper, but in various ranks throughout the department so that there is, um, you know, the idea that, you know, they might be able to promote or, you know, even potentially lead the, lead the agency at, at some point. We've had, um, you know, African-American uh, directors in the past. Uh, we've had female uh, director in the past. Um, and so, so that's important. And then again, right now, it's just really working with the community to see what we can do to partner together to, to create that interest. So, so John, I, I want to ask you about the, the kind of broader uh, context of discussion about police reform. And, you know, there are a lot of people talking about much more drastic changes uh, to the way that we fund policing, to the way that we structure policing. Uh, are there things from, from that narrative that you would throw onto the pile here as well and say that we ought to be thinking about uh, in terms of uh, the state police? Well, uh, yes, uh, there are a package of bills that have been introduced in the legislature that would, uh, that would allow us to have more police accountability. Uh, so certainly we embrace those. Um, in this instance, again, I just um, uh, have to refer back to the study that was done by um, by MSU and where it shows even uh, post-stop the level of searches that are involved uh, with people of color uh, significantly higher <laughs> than, uh, than those of other, of other races. So uh, I refer back to some of the recommendations made in the report, uh, specifically seven through nine, with, uh, which deal with post-stop uh, outcome results and and uh, and recommending that the Michigan State Police track uh, when searches are conducted, the outcomes of those searches, the disposition of those searches, um, and also uh, recommendation number twelve, with which wants to mesh uh, the trooper's characteristic uh, with the traffic stop database. So we begin to get a profile of the troopers who are beginning who are, who are making these stops in which they are significantly higher. A percentage of people of color being arrested than others, uh, per per the census and per other things. So, um, so those are sort of the uh, I think the progressive sort of recommendations that could be embraced. That again would bring more accountability, which is what we seek. Uh, again, we laud Colonel Jasper for and laud his leadership, uh, and just the fact that he is reform minded. Uh, so we're behind him all the way with that, and like him to embrace some of these other things, which will take 
the reforms to the level where there's, again, some accountability. Okay, uh, Colonel Gasper and John Johnson, it was great to have both of you here uh, to talk about this important work. And Colonel Gasper, of course, we wish you the best uh, in, in implementing these recommendations. Yeah, I, okay. I, I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It's Black History Month, and we want to kick it off with a look back at a Detroiter who really left a legacy here in the city. Dr. Charles H. Wright was a visionary and an activist, and of course, a noted obstetrician who delivered thousands of babies in the city. I was one of those children that he delivered. He also founded the city's first international Afro-American museum in 1965. Today, of course, we know that state-of-the-art facility as the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Bridge Detroit's Orlando Bailey had a conversation with someone who knew Dr. Wright very well, the museum's director of design and fabrication, Kevin Davidson. Kevin Davidson, director of design and fabrication at the Charles H. Wright Museum for African American History. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. You're getting ready to make 40 years as right. being at the Charles H. Wright Museum for African American History. Okay, 40 years. Talk yes. about talk talk about your your experience uh, being there. I mean, you've I think 40 years you've seen it in at least two of the locations, the former locations mm -hmm. and now the current location. Um, yes. Talk about this journey of 40 years, getting to 40 at the right. Well, I was just a, a kid when I started, you know, okay. just a young college <laughs> student. Um, I did a year at uh, Alabama State, and it just happened to be uh, Dr. Wright's alma mater. Yeah. Um, and, Who delivered uh, half of Detroit, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thousands of babies, something like 70,000 yeah, babies. Um, but I started over on the boulevard in the little three row house uh, that was the museum back. That's in, the uh, first location, right? That's the first location. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I started there officially in 1983. Hmm. And, uh, you know, my first job was to design an exhibit on black voting rights. Um, wow. And Dr. Wright loved that exhibit. I was a contractor, started as a contractor. Uh, then moved on to an exhibit on um, Charles Drew. Uh, he loved that. And then finally, he just said, hey, you may as well hang around. <laughs> so I was hired um, and wasn't there long before um, this partnership between the museum and the city of Detroit came about. Mm -hmm. um, and. Coleman Young worked with Dr. Wright to uh, increase the vision and provide the resources to uh, expand the museum and uh, you know bring um, you know this larger vision to fruition. That was one of Dr. Wright's favorite words. You wish it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's so, so interesting and funny to uh -huh. hear. You, you tell of this history because some of it was happening in my lifetime. Mm. Well, I, remember, mm -hmm. I remember being a, a, a younger Orlando, yes. uh, going into the present uh, edifice and all okay, of the yep. grandeur when it opened. Yep. And, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I remember uh, architects drawing up the plans for the second museum mm -hmm. that's a, a block from here, just a block north of where we are right now, that's yeah. occupied by, it was bought and is occupied by CCS Yes. now. And even the, the then construction began and, and it finished, we moved in there. Um, and I think even before the building was finished, they were starting on drawings for, for the new facility. You know, so Dr. Wright and Coleman Young were moving fast. You had a personal relationship yes. uh, with mm -hmm. Dr. Wright. Tell mm -hmm. me about uh, that relationship, that, that mentee-mentor relationship, and, and how you carry that with you today. It started, um, you know, from day one when I was hired. And, uh, you know, Dr. Wright 
um, in addition to um, you know, wanting to put together exhibits over on the boulevard, also conducted educational programming that took place at Wayne State. And so, um, you know, he'd have me designing uh, little cards uh, that contained uh, information on these different workshops and, and uh, presentations he was giving at Wayne State. So we worked very closely together. Um, you know, he would provide uh, people to work with me on the exhibitions, to uh, write scripts and um, collect uh, images and, and objects and that sort of thing. And, and uh, so we kind of had, you know, shared vision. You know, he knew what he wanted in terms of what that exhibit was going to be, but not necessarily, you know, the best way to, to pull it off and make it look great. And so, you know, we, we kept our heads together on that. And uh, uh, so we kind of laid a foundation, you know, and uh, there has been occasion where, you know, he's come to me and asked for artwork. So uh, I've created illustrations for, you know, promotional posters related to programming that he mm -hmm. organized. And even after we moved to the second facility, he was still engaged in quite a bit of educational programming. Black History Month is literally a, a page turn away, and I'm sure that the right is going to see an influx of visitors. And King Tut exhibit is back. What can people expect? Well, um, you know, it's an exhibition that uh, includes um, replicas of the various items, chairs, sculptures, chariot, things that were found in uh, King Tut Commons uh, burial chamber, as well as, and that would be regarded as the private stuff. And then you have the more um, public King Tut items um, that are in the first four sections in our larger gallery. So it's between two galleries, the AT&T, which, which is our largest gallery, and then the Chase Gallery, which is, uh, a little smaller, probably about a third or no, half the size. And uh, so in the public area, you know, you also have sculptures of, uh, uh, you know, Ak Akhenaten, uh, of uh, Nefertiti, um, and, you know, objects that would have been sculpted for them. So um, that's the full scope. Kevin, tell me as, you know, the director of design and fabrication at the right, what your role is in bringing an exhibit like the King Tut exhibit to life at the museum? Well, here at the museum, um, my department is a, a department of two. It's myself and another designer. Her name is Shivani Dodger. And, uh, you know, we collaborate on a lot of this design, you know, she's uh, a, a very technical person, knows how to, you know, she's a wizard with all the software and she can work on these interactives and bring those to life. And so, you know, that's a, a, uh, an important component of what's been added to this exhibit. But my role um, is to lead uh, the design of these uh, permanent and changing exhibitions here. And so for the King Tut exhibit, um, we essentially took a collection of stuff. And it's our job to create an exhibit out of that. And so we start with, uh, you know, generally a list of what the items are and photographs of them and dimensions and, and put together a floor plan. Um, then we move to elevations of the spaces um, and then uh, the color scheme and the lighting and, uh, you know, design the um, overall environment for it. So a lot goes into it to make actually, it uh, exciting. Yeah. yeah, it's actually really cool. And I think this exhibit is particularly exciting because, you know, uh, it, it seems so recent, right? 1920 was not 
the 1920s was not long ago mm -hmm. where archaeology right. actually discovered and found a lot of these artifacts for King Tut. And so people are still yeah. very interested. In, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's, we're celebrating the 100th year of the discovery of these things. So it's a, it's a milestone and an opportunity, you know, for us to bring it back and for, you know, our community to enjoy it and experience it. Happy Black History Month to you and all the folks at the right. Kevin Davison, Director of Fabrication and Design at the Charles H. Wright Museum. Thank you so much for joining us on American Black Journal. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. That is going to do it for us this week. Thanks for watching. You can always find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.